Hi, uh, I'm Bruce Schneier. Uh, are there any questions? <laughs> I'm serious. This is real short if there aren't. In the back. Yeah, it's a funny question because at DEF CON last year, someone asked, it might have been you, someone asked the same question. <laughs> I, I forget, I got it off the internet. I can wait. If I can't see you, you have to wave around. There are a lot of lights around here. You didn't fly me to Hungary to have me stand here and stare at you. Mm hmm. I'm sorry, what'd you say? I was saying that uh, you get excited to hear about you. Uh, what are you, your expectations about uh, being the leading name of this conference? The question was, what are my expectations about being the leading name of this conference? I expected questions from the audience. Well, what do you people want to hear about? <laughs> yeah, there's a question. Excellent. Has ever Questions, has I ever been hacked? It's actually an interesting question because you, you know, the, the answer is no. And, and it's, it's often interesting to wonder why. Because right? you're a pretty big name in security. And you'd think that you know some of you guys or somebody else would say, oh, it'll be fun. Let's hack Bruce Schneier. I think it's because I, I'm, I don't piss off people. <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, I'm not, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't nag you, I don't taunt, I don't uh, complain about things. I mean, I complain about things, but I think, I think I'm pretty upfront and honest, and, and I think uh, people generally respect that. So, no, I have not been hacked. I mean, I don't want to, I want to take it as a challenge, because I'm, I think I'm pretty lucky, because you'd think I would be a target. But so far, so good. Oh, you're the only one asking questions, so go. The question is, why am I sure of that? And actually, it's a, it's a good point. I suppose I'm not sure of it. I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. You, because well, I mean, there are two reasons I'd be hacked, right? One is someone wants to steal money. So I'd kind of know because money was stolen. And the other, because someone wants to, uh, to brag about it. And I'd know because they bragged about it. I mean, you know, you, you, I suppose we can speculate whether it's any uh, you know, international intelligence organizations, like the NSA, have hacked me. And right, they wouldn't either steal money or brag about it, so I suppose I wouldn't know about that. You know, I like to think I'm not an intelligence target, but who knows? In the back. The question is, have I ever felt that I've been a target? And the answer is yes. I think there's a, is cert, I think for a lot of the politically inclined security researchers in the United States, so like the Whit Diffies or the Matt Blaze or myself, there's a good chance that we are you know, NSA persons of interest. So that when I am uh, you know, checking my email from Hungary back to the United States, that my communications are logged. And you know, you know hopefully uh, SSL is good enough and, and, and they're, they're secure. But my guess is yes, there's a reasonable chance that that those of us who talk about this stuff and are political are monitored by, by at least the U.S. government and potentially others. Do I recognize agents sitting here? No, they pick agents I wouldn't recognize, right? You know. I mean, I, th I think you'll learn that the first day of spy school. Yes? If I had a chance to hack someone, who would hack? I, you know, I, I consider myself a theoretician, not a hacker. I mean, to me, a hacker is someone who does stuff, right? Who writes code or builds things or figures out stuff or breaks into systems. I, I, I don't do that. I'm much more of a theoretician. I'm much more of a generalist. I'm more of a mathematician. So I, I, I don't think along those terms. 
you know, I can't think of anybody whose you know stuff I'd want to break into, you know, except like the the normal famous political people you'd all think of. But you know, I hope the uh, the media does that for me. Ah, we were going good for a while. Yes, it's people in the front, people in the back. I can I can see you if you raise your hand. Yes. Question is, why did I choose security as a as a profession? You know, I, and I think this is interesting. I think security security people are more born than they are uh, than they than they sort of choose the career. I think security is a mindset. There's a mindset to being a hacker, and you know you might think of it as someone who says, you know, look at this, 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 and it, and, and it works. And a hacker would say, well, do that, and it doesn't work. And then the designer would say, well, don't do that. And the hacker would say, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that every day until you fix it. A hacker is someone, a security professional, is someone who looks at systems and how to break them. Right? Not because they want to do malice, not because they're criminals, but because that's the way they think. Right? You think in terms of how do I get around the system. And to all of you, when you go through airport security, the first thing you think of is, well, how can I cheat this? Right? You don't do it, but that's how you think. And if someone thinks that way, they're a good security professional. And then after that, it's learning the facts, learning you know, computers or learning, I don't know, door guards or airplanes or you know, whatever the, the, the domain of expertise is. But that mindset of looking at systems and, and figuring out naturally how to break them, I think is something you learn at an early age, probably because it's fun. I mean, this is why you'll see, you know, hackers turn into good security people. I mean, hacking is just figuring out how things work. Once you do that, you figure out how they don't work. So I'm not convinced I chose security, so security chose me. Right, I entered this field sort of through mathematics. My career has been an endless series of generalizations. Right, first mathematical security, then computer security and network security, and then security economics. And now I do more, most of my work in the psychology of security. You know, looking at how security and technology and people interact. In there you go. Is about the general level of security sort of in the world? Uh, I, what, what's, what's the security awareness of the, of the general population? I mean, it, I mean, you know the answer, it's pretty low. I mean, and there are a bunch of reasons for it. Right? This stuff is hard. I mean, try to explain security to your mother. Right? That's what it's like. You know, not because your mother's dumb, because this isn't her area of expertise. And whether it's computer security or, I don't know, prescription drug safety or airplane security or building codes, I mean, the, these are specialized domains of expertise. And most people don't understand them. Now, this is okay. This is the way our society works. Right? I don't understand anything about airplane safety. But I flew here on a Malav jet because I trusted whatever rules there were, regulations that, uh, you know, that surround airplane safety. I mean, we're all sitting here and we're not really worried this, the roof is going to fall over our heads, even though this building is kind of questionable, right? <laughs> right? Because, not because we understand construction safety. Great. Right? But because we trust the building codes that have been in place, you know, since when? The 50s? That it'll little, you know, build buildings that won't fall down. Now, and computer security is no different. I mean, people aren't going to understand it. The problem we have, unfortunately, is we expect people to make security decisions on the internet. So they don't understand the threats, they don't understand the technology, yet we expect them to make smart decisions. And that's just, that they just can't do that. Just like I can't make a smart decision about airplane safety. I just have to get on the airplane and trust. But the system is built so I can do that. Right? They don't say, okay, we'll get on the plane, you go inspect the wing. Right? I've never inspected a wing. 
But we'll say that, right? You know, here's your computer, here's your network, you go, you know, go check your certificate. Your mother can't check your certificate. Well, there's no certificate is. And, and we, have, we really can't expect her to. So this thing, the state of awareness of security on the internet is low, but I don't think that's ever going to change. I think we as designers need to build our systems to be secure even though there is no security awareness. No, over there. Okay, good. What kind of security do I have at home? Uh, not much. I, I run an open Wi-Fi network, and, and I, there's, there's an essay on my website about why I, I don't encrypt my network. I mean, I, I think it's I mean, I think it's just polite to have an open network for people to use. Right? I mean, I don't care. I, I mean, I secure uh, my computers, but you know, there's not a lot there. And doors, yeah, <laughs> secure doors. You know, it depends on where you live. I mean, and that's relatively recent. You know, a few generations ago, nobody locked their doors. In the United States, probably in Hungary either. You know, locking your door was, was something that really was invented when, the, when cities be, uh, became, you know, came into four. In really modern cities. So, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I tend to think that most people are pretty safe most of the time. And that, that sort of living a, a, a paranoid existence is, is, is more harm than good. And I saw a hand sort of over there-ish. There it is. Question about what should manufacturers do to improve security? It's an interesting question. I mean, the, the, the easy answer is pay attention, right, and do what you have to do. I mean, the reason most so I mean, to me, the reason most software and, and hardware, you know, networking stuff, everything, is insecure is because the customers don't care in general. And there's no liability for the manufacturer. You know, for, so for example, if I you know, bought a car and the car wasn't safe, I would be able to sue the manufacturer. Right? So there's now a financial incentive on the car manufacturer to make that car safe. There's no similar financial incentive on software vendors. And if you read a license agreement, it basically says, you know, if this software deliberately kills your children, and, and, we, and we knew it would, but didn't tell you because we thought it might hurt sales, uh, we're not liable. I mean, that's what the license agreements look like. And so to me, once you have real software liabilities, once vendors are liable, for security vulnerabilities, you will get improvement. And it'll be all the things we know. It'll be you know, writing code more securely. It'll be having fewer options. It'll be automatic updates. I mean, all the things we, we, we know how to write secure code. We know how to write reliable code. It's just expensive. Right? And, and, and the market doesn't reward it. So you need either regulations or liabilities to put the right financial incentives in place. This is basic security economics. Right? You, the market won't do something unless the market rewards it. If the market will never reward it, it is a, uh, it, it's an externality, you have to do it either through liabilities or regulation. So you people there, there are actually a bunch of seats. Whoever has a seat open next to them, raise their hand. Okay, everyone pick somebody and then go sit next to them. You can come in. It's okay. There are probably people behind you. Go, come, 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 come. I won't even make you ask a question. Yes? What do you think about Australia's uh, firewall? They want to take uh, security in the state's hands, but it mostly should be in the user's hands or the, or the service provider's hand, but they want to take it on the state level. So this is a question about Australia's firewall. Australia is, is looking at... Uh, you know, doing a lot of its security at the, at the national level. And it's not just Australia, right? United States is looking at having the Cyber Command take over a lot of security. It's still being discussed, but we're seeing this kind of uh, move in a bunch of countries. China, you know, to take a completely different example of a state doing it for, for somewhat different reasons. And a lot of this has to do with the, uh, the cyber war debate. 
that we're seeing pop up in a lot of countries. Uh, you know, NATO is, is talking a lot of this, United States is, Russia is, China is, Australia also. I, you know, I think in largely this is a mistake. I certainly think the military, the government needs to deal with government and military networks, but to put the government in charge of, you know, the civilian corporate personal network, I think does more harm than good. But this is going to be a battle in the upcoming years, and you watch it. In the United States, uh, the military is gaining more power. And it's the part of the military closely aligned with the NSA to surveil the network, to uh, to uh, you know, and to and to secure it. So I, I'm I, I'm not happy with this development, but it does seem like a a global trend that is going to gain momentum, and and reversing it will take effort. I see a hand over there. So the question was about encryption, and it, it, was, it was centered, it asked, uh, I mean, it was sort of the conspiracy theory of encryption. Is, is it possible that some shadowy organization, I guess either government or criminal, right, right, the good guys or the bad guys, knows how to break RSA or DES or, you know, or AES or something and just isn't telling us, right? Is it using it for their purposes? I suppose it's possible. I consider it really unlikely you know, it's interesting. Over the past few decades, we've seen dramatic shifts in where cryptography knowledge lies. So when you looked at the 1970s, the NSA had knew how to do cryptography and nobody else did. I mean, the Russians probably also. Right? I mean, so the, the big intelligence organizations and nobody else did. And, and you look at the state of the academic research, it was, it was just terrible. Uh, that's very much changed, you know, through the 80s, 90s and, and, and this decade, that a lot of cryptographic breakthroughs come from the public, you know, come from academia, and come from the, the open world of cryptography, such that now when we see uh, NSA algorithms, we understand them better. Right? NSA gave us DES in 1985, 86, it wasn't until the mid-90s that we understood how they designed it and why. We learned different, we, invent, we had to reinvent differential cryptanalysis. We saw another algorithm called Skipjack and we figured it out a little quicker. Uh, NSA gave us SHA, basically an encryption algorithm in a, embedded in a hash function. And we found a flaw in it and they were forced to upgrade it. You're right? So, a lot of the knowledge is now coming from the academic world. This isn't to say the NSA doesn't have more. Because if you think about it, there's a one-way function. You've got you know, the secret organization, you know, the NSA or GCHQ in the UK or, or GRU in Russia, and they have their own research, and then there's the outside research. Everything outside goes in, but nothing comes out. So this is going to know more. But I think the advantage in here we are in 2010, is much lower. Additionally, computers have gotten so fast that encryption algorithms are very, very over-designed. So DES had a 56-bit key. When it was designed in the 70s, that was too big to brute force. But fast forward, what, 25 years, and we were able to do it. Right? Current algorithms might have 256-bit keys, 128-bit keys. And these are so hard to brute force that we can't even imagine you know, computers being built of matter operating in you know, the, the human lifetimes that could do it. So even good cryptanalysis of these algorithms won't yield practical breaks. So I think it is unlikely that an organization, either an intelligence or a criminal, 
has the ability to do cryptanalysis at, at that kind of scale. So that being said, encryption systems are still very vulnerable and I believe organizations like the NSA break them all the time. They break them not by breaking the encryption but by breaking the implementation. Right? Exploiting some flaw in the software around the encryption. So a flaw in the random number generator. Right? A flaw in, in, in how the algorithm is used. You know, I, I mean, there, there's, uh, I used to do this, I have colleagues who do this, who look at commercial encryption systems, you know, as a consultant and try to break them. And pretty much every time they break them. And, but it's not because of the cryptography, it's because of the stuff around the cryptography. It's uh, side channels. So this is how I think organizations like the NSA read encrypted traffic today. They don't break the crypto, they get around the crypto. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're using PGP if, you know, someone has a sniffer or a Trojan in your computer, right? They're going to read the traffic after you decrypt it or before you encrypt it, right? And that's a much more profitable way to get in to somebody's data. Uh, up here. Question about a new kind of Cold War that started on the internet. Well, certainly something has started on the internet. Uh, I don't want to call it a Cold War, but certainly there is a lot of espionage on the internet. Uh, the, the, you know, I know most of, most of what I know is sort of about China, but other, it's other countries too. The United States is doing a lot. But there is definitely serious espionage going on on the internet right now. I mean, national, and in China, it's less nationally sponsored, more nationally tolerated. And so there are hackers in China who, you know, don't take direction from the government, but they sort of know that if they find something good, they should let somebody know, and then they're left alone. So that, that's more common. You know, and, and this is getting to be a bigger deep deal. I mean, I, I worry about it, because I think things are moving from passive espionage to active exploitation. And it's one thing to break into a network and eavesdrop. It's something else entirely to break into a network and leave code that you can use at a later date to, uh, to cause damage. And I think that latter thing is happening more and more. I mean, the U.S. is doing it, China's doing it, and probably other countries as well. So there is a worry this will get out of hand. You know, I, I've done a lot of writing. I think the whole cyber war threat is very overblown. But I think now is the time that, that nations should actually start working out cyber treaties, cyber war treaties. You know, what is permissible, what is not permissible. And these early days, I think, is a good time for nations to get together and do this. I don't think it's likely to happen. But I think it would be a good idea. So I hand down here. The question was about full disclosure. Now, I assume people here know the full disclosure debate. The question is when, when you, when one of you, you know, finds a vulnerability in a major piece of software, what, what should you do? Should you tell the vendor? Should you tell the world? Should you do something in the middle? Right? And this is the full disclosure debate. You know, and, and to understand it, you sort of have to remember what happened before. You know, back in the early days, you know, the 80s, even, even the early 90s, when, when, when a researcher would find a, a software flaw, They'd alert the vendor, and the vendor would do nothing for years, right? Because why would they bother? And it's only when vulnerabilities are, are announced to the public do the vendor says, oh my God, I have to fix this, and they do. Right? So, so full disclosure, or at least the threat of full disclosure, is what keeps vendors honest. If we all said, we're not going to disclose vulnerabilities. We'll just tell the vendors. We're just going to, we'll, we would just go back to the old ways. They, they, would, they, wouldn't, they would take their time fixing things. Now oh, we'll save the next release. Why bother? Right? So it is the, uh, it's the bad publicity that forces them to fix things. So that being said, you know, we, we've sort of, as a community, developed you know, a little more responsible ways of doing this. We, we will announce, we'll tell the vendor first, give them a you know, head start. 
So here's a vulnerability. You've got two weeks to fix it. I'm going to go public, or I've got a month to fix it. Well, you know, whatever, whatever you decide. And that seems to be a good compromise. But certainly, the disclosing vulnerabilities is how we get them fixed. That provides the economic incentive for the vendors to fix flaws. So we cannot go back to the old way. And, and you know, you see collisions of cultures. Uh, you know, we all know about full disclosure. Software vendors are used to it. Uh, Matt Blaze, a, a security researcher at the University of Pennsylvania, did some theoretical work on, on, on locks, on physical locks and lock picking, and wrote papers on vulnerabilities that have been around for, what, you know, 100 years that no one ever wrote about before. And the locksmith community vilified him. I mean, they were really pissed because they're used to this stuff being secret. But as it turned out, here he, there's a vulnerability in a certain set of locks that has been around for 100 years that the vendors never bothered fixing. So you know, that's the opposite of full disclosure. Right? The guild system where knowledge is kept secret. You really can't do that on computers. And yeah, you really can't do that anywhere anymore. Right? Knowledge flows too freely. I see a hand back, actually I see a program back there. I assume a hand's attached to it. Someone has to relay this question up to the front, because I can't hear it. So it's my opinion regarding information gathering, you know, by, by us or, you know, I mean. I don't think I know enough to have an opinion about it. Question is about the future of IT security. And he says, where we'll be in five years. I think we'll be the same place we are right now. I mean, I don't see a lot of change. I mean, the last big change in IT security is when, uh, when hacking, when, 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 when uh, breaking into networks turn, turned from a, from a hobbyist pursuit to a criminal pursuit. That was about seven years ago now. And, and, and the, now the criminals have taken, sort of taken over. I don't see a lot of change. I mean, what I want to see is more automatic security. We talked about that before. But I don't think there's a lot of big, big breakthroughs happening. You know, you know, the fundamental problems in security are really no longer about security. They're about using security. I mean, that's where the, the hard stuff is, the user interface, implementation, installation, you know, all of that update. Right? That's the hard stuff. We kind of have all the security we need. It's just not being used well. You know, and, and while I see a lot of research in these areas, I don't see a lot of movement. So I don't think we're going to see much difference between now and five years from now. You know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's some breakthrough. But I, I just don't see it on the horizon. I mean, a lot of cool stuff happening. But I'm not sure how much difference it's going to make. Yes? Oh, I mean, the fact that there are no changes doesn't I mean there's nothing interesting. Lots of interesting things happen. The question is, you know, are they actually going to fundamentally change the level of security? And, that, and I say no. But in terms of interesting things, interesting, interesting things happen every day, right? That's why you, I can write the blog and cryptogram and, 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 you know, write essays and papers. A lot of great things happening. But I, I just don't see a lot of fundamental changes. I, it's what I said. I, I want to see better user interface, you know, better using of security. That, that's really what I'd like to see. You know, better integration of, of economic principles in security uh, products and services. So just one more question. Uh, in education or on government side? What kind of change do you want to see in, educa in education? You know, I mean, I'm not a big fan of education. I mean, that's a stupid, that's not a way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll, there are people who talk about that we have to educate the user. 
And I, I always think, have they ever met an actual user? I think educating the user is the wrong way to go. I think you have to, I mean, again, think of your mother. I think we have to assume a naive user and build systems secure around that. Uh, there's a hand back there. Did you? So trends in attacks against financial institutions, this is actually kind of interesting because what, what we see here is a, is a really uh, a basic arms race that criminals continue to attack financial institutions. I mean, I don't know how big it is here in Hungary because you got, you, one of your defenses is your language barrier. Right? You know, I mean, you know, for someone to send a spam email to you, they've got to you know, write it in Hungarian, which is hard for people living in China, for example. Right? They're much more likely to write, I mean, just like you write an exploit for the Windows, because everyone's, you know, everyone's using Windows, you write your spam in English because most of your targets speak English. So the trends I see in, 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 in financial crime are things getting, turning from passive to active and from general to targeted. Right? So, you know, traditionally most attacks have been stealing, you know, sort of passive attacks, eavesdropping and stealing passwords and stealing money. Uh, as banks implement better authentication or two-factor authentication or other security mechanisms, you see more active attacks. You see man-in-the-middle attacks. You see Trojans. You see, so you see much more active attacks. You also see better targeted attacks. So instead of going after everybody, you pick a certain bank, a certain corporation, a certain person, right? and, and, and you target your attacks to them. And, and those, those are certainly more likely to work, especially as the banks build security against these lowest common denominator attacks. But the result is, I don't think we're any safer, but the attacks look different. So those are the trends I see, and I think those will continue. I think the proportion of targeted active attacks will increase right, as the security covers more of the passive general attacks. No, 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 you gotta wait. Now you gotta, now you gotta wait your turn. The way back. I'm trusting you, yeah. I want to be able to hear you. You might have to walk up to the fr uh, close to the front. Question is, what do I think about privacy? Is it dead? Uh, no, I don't. It's simply because you're all wearing clothes and you're not telling me your annual salary right now. Uh, privacy certainly isn't dead. I think privacy is sort of a, is a fundamental human need. And that we all as people need privacy. Right? We need to keep some of our thoughts to ourselves. We need to be able to write you know, letters to our loved ones and, and talk to our friends and, and tell our doctors things we wouldn't tell other people. And, and that's never going to change. Now, what is changing is, is how public people are. Right? What's changing is social norms. I mean, a lot of this depends on how old you are, you know, what you're used to. Right? And there, there are, you know, there, I think there's a, lar a very large generational shift going on. I mean, the internet is the greatest generation gap since rock and roll. And you have to remember that. So I think there are a lot of changes happening as more of our data goes into the hands of others. But privacy is not going to go away because it is too valuable. And I think there are a lot of, uh, of forces uh, uh, arrayed against it right now. And, and there's a lot of diminishing privacy. But I actually believe that's temporary. You know, maybe 5, 10, 20 years. And 10, 20 years. Because it is too important to give up. And we as society will eventually realize that. Privacy is hard because you don't really miss it until it's gone. Right? It's like any fundamental human right. You know, you, you, kind of, you start taking it for granted. But then it goes away and you realize it's gone. And, and that's bad. And I, so I've written a lot about this. If you sort of you know, type Schneier and privacy into Google, you'll, you'll get various essays of mine on 
on this, but I, I don't think it's dead. And I, and I disagree with the uh, Mort Zuckerberg and Eric, Sch Eric Schmidt and, and Larry Ellison who, who say privacy is dead. I think they're trying to kill it, but I think they're going to fail. Another in the back. I like questions in the back. You people in the front are, I mean, I mean you're good because of it. They, if, they, if they ever you know, get tired, I've got you guys, but I'm going to stay in the back for a while. It, it's the far away and the, and the language bad, and the accent that can make these hard. <laughs> um, what's your uh, opinion? How will the HTCP be cracked? Do you think they'll ever be as successful as DRM? So, so no, I, mean, I, don't think I don't think they'll ever be as successful. Well, actually, that's not a the question. was about DRM, will they ever be successful? Uh, you know, there are two kinds of attackers. Right? There's, you know, your grandmother who wants to make another copy of a Disney movie, and there's the professional pirates in Hong Kong. And pretty much everything works against your grandmother, and pretty much nothing works against the pirates in Hong Kong. And, and that's the way it'll always be. Fundamentally, this is an impossible problem. The, the, the very, very generally, what we want to do is attach permission to bits. We want to take a blob of bits and attach some kind of permission to it. Who can copy it? And who can view it? Where, you know, I mean, whatever it is we want to do, some kind of control. Fundamentally, that's impossible. Right? Because the bit can be copied without those permissions. Bits are bits. You know, making bits uncopyable is like making water not wet. You can't do it. Right? But, you know, a little blinky red light that says, danger, don't copy this, your grandmother's going to say, oh, I can't copy it, red blinky light. Right? So anything will work against the amateur. I mean, d even DHCP will still work against the amateur. Nothing will work against the professional. And that will always be true. Right? We can make it harder for the professional. DHCP was a hardware-only system. So it took a long time for someone to crack it. And because it's hardware-only, you're not going to see a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of software that'll, that'll allow you to get around it, because someone has to build the hardware. I mean, it'll happen. I mean, you'll probably see them for sale in the streets of Hong Kong in a few months. But it's still going to be sort of underground. You know, it, it's harder than software. But no, copy protection is fundamentally unsolvable. You know, it, it is a basic property of bits that they are copyable. And you cannot change that. All right, one of my front people. Wow, so this is a hot topics in IT security. What an interesting question. So what interests me right now? Certainly uh, the hash function competition, which I'm surprised nobody's asked about yet. I mean, it shows you that, I, that I'm interested in it and you guys aren't. But uh, I mean, this is actually is interesting. Uh, people remember in the mid-90s we had an encryption competition. We wanted to replace DES and the US government, uh, NIST, had a competition for the AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. And it was actually great fun. It's a, sort of a cryptographic demolition derby. We all put our algorithms in the ring, we beat each other up, last one left standing wins. You know, it was sort of like that. And we got a, a really good standard out of it. Uh, algorithm called Ringdahl became the new AES. Right? My algorithm was two fish, it, it was a finalist, didn't, didn't, make the, uh, didn't, make the, didn't become the standard. So NIST is doing the same thing in this decade with a hash function. They want to in, come up with SHA-3, so they put in a call for submissions. They got 64 submissions. Uh, it was uh, whittled down to, I think it was 15 or 16, I forget. I think 15. And, and, so, and this year, the, the 15 are, are going through the process. And at the end of the year, they're going to pick five to go into the next round. Then they'll pick a single standard. So my algorithm is called SCAIN, and it is in the competition. And we made the first cut. And at the end of the year, we'll see if we make the top five. I mean, this is, I mean, this is phenomenally good for, for a whole lot of reasons. One, you get, we get a new standard, which will be good and strong. Two, this stimulates research. Suddenly, you have 64 and now 15 targets, algorithms that cryptanalysts can study and write papers about. And we're seeing a huge amount of research being stimulated in hash functions. Right? So even if there's no standard, 
This is great stuff. And if you're interested, I mean, type SHA-3 NIST into Google, you'll, you'll get you know, various things. I wrote about this a few, a few times in Cryptogram on my blog. You can, you can find those. If you're all interested in cryptography, this is where the cool stuff is happening right now. Oh, another hand in the back. Yes. Who is the what? Elvis. The Elvis? <laughs> Not all generation gaps have an Elvis. <laughs> Only one did. And maybe that was an anomaly. <laughs> Who's in charge? How long am I on stage for? Okay, so how, when, do, when do I get off? Well, why, don't you, why don't you wave at me when I'm done? How about we'll do it that way? Okay. All right. He's in charge of kicking me off stage. Gr green coat people. There are chairs. There are chairs over there. I have five minutes. Okay. okay. Who has a five minute question? Or two, two and a half minute questions? All right. There's. So the question was about uh, self-incrimination. Now, the, the, I mean, I don't know a lot about about the law here. In the United States, we have a, there's a it's actually written into the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, that you can't be forced to self-incriminate yourself. And the, the, it's an interesting legal question: is whether being forced to divulge the encryption key for your hard drive constitutes self-incrimination? And I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a constitutional scholar. And I don't know what the legal answer to that is. It seems obvious to me that releasing the key to your data is the same thing as giving them your data, which could be self-incrimination. Right? That seems obvious to me. You know, in, generally, in general, the, the, the notion of technological invariance, I think, is important that we need to start thinking about laws that are technologically invariant, that don't change as technology changes, because technology is changing very, very fast. And so whatever the self-incrimination laws should be, it shouldn't matter if it's telling someone something, giving letters, or giving email, or, or letting them go into your, your Gmail account. It should be the same thing, right? Because technology is changing, but the relationship the person has with the data isn't. So it's a hard question, and, and, and it's also very, uh, very geographical. The United States answer might not be the answer here. So don't know. So a hand uh, over there. I think it's a new hand. Question about the future of PKI? God, I think I wrote. I think I wrote an essay like 15 years ago or 10 years ago saying, you know, PKI is overrated and, and I don't know if you people remember, they were around. We would get the year of the PKI and it would be the year of the PKI at the RSA conference and it was like, it's going to be the year of the PKI until you guys actually get one, right? And, and I, so I think PKI is, is, has always been overrated. I mean, it, it has a place just like every security tool does, but it's not, not a ubiquitous panacea. So I, I've, I've never been a PKI fan. Uh, old essay I wrote from the, oh God, it was over 10 years ago called 10 Risks of PKI. You can look that up. You can sort of see what I thought about it back then and it hasn't changed. Last All right, last question. Anybody? Yeah, oh, I see in the back. Okay, you will be judged by your peers at the quality of your question. <laughs>
So that was about net neutrality. Yeah, I'm. I, I, you know, I, I think we're. I think we're going to lose it. I think there's a lot of corporate forces internationally that really, really want to discriminate traffic. They want to do it to uh, maintain monopoly on on things they're doing, and, and to uh, to lock out other people. They want to do it to uh, be able to sell premium services. Right? They want to do it for uh, control. They want to do it for security reasons. They want to do it to stop file sharing. Yeah, and and you know, with all of that corporate might, it's increasingly hard to maintain the neutral stance. I mean, we're still doing it, but I think we're losing the perception battle. So I'm not optimistic. You know, I wish I was more optimistic. I think, I think net neutrality is really important. I think it's what made the net great. And in an internet, in a world that changes so fast, when we don't know what the next thing is, we can't discriminate against it. Because we're going we're gonna to sacrifice our own future. But I, I'm not that optimistic in the near term. All right, so that's it. I'm going to be back here in the afternoon. Uh, somebody translated a book of mine into Hungarian, amazingly enough, and they found a picture of me I've never seen before and put it on the cover. <laughs> I, I'm holding something. I don't know what it is. And so I'm doing a book signing, I think, in this room sometime in the afternoon. And I brought, you know, if you don't want to buy a book, I brought flyers for the English language book. It's, it's like, it's the thin version. And, and these are, I think, on the registration desk. You can grab one of these. Right? It's, it's, it's much easier reading. But, but don't tell anybody, but every essay in, in, in this book is on the internet. So you actually don't have to buy them unless you want it in convenient book form. I guess they're not on the internet in Hungarian, but in English they are. So if you go to schneier.com, you can look up all my essays and, and, and read this stuff. So thank you very much for inviting me. Have a great weekend. I'll be here all day. So come and say hi.